it's really a distinct pleasure to introduce Gary, um, this year's uh, alumni recipient. After completing medical school and his pediatric residency at Baylor, Gary came to UNC in 1990 as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar and a preventive medicine resident. While completing those degrees, um, uh, those programs, Gary earned an MPH from our department in 1992. And for the next six years, he was a faculty member in both pediatrics and what we would call then health policy and administration. In 1998, he joined the faculty at the University of Michigan, where he's currently the Percy and Mary Murphy Professor of Pediatrics, a professor of health management and policy, and the director of faculty programs in the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion. Um, Gary has more than 30 years experience in children's health services research. He's been the principal investigator of numerous federal, state, and foundation-funded grants, including the first NIH-funded Pediatric Health Services Research Fellowship Program. He has more than 300 peer-reviewed publications on child health policy and health economics, immunization, physician behavior, the medical workforce, and interspecialty variation in the provision of preventive services to, to your children. One current focus of his current research is child health equity. I got to get to the second page. So Gary has done a lot in his um, in his time uh, at Michigan. Um, Gary is past president of the Society for Pediatric Research, the largest research society in the field of child health, um, which honored him in 2009 with the Douglas K. Richardson Lifetime Achievement Award for perinatal and pedi pediatric healthcare research. Um, he has received the 2018 Distinguished, Distinguished Alumni Award, Award from the um, Baylor College of Medicine and the 2019 Academy Health Pediatric Section Lifetime Achievement Award. Dr. Freed serves on numerous national and international committees regarding child health. He's currently the president of the International Pediatric Research Foundation and was a senior Fulbright scholar to the, um, to the Netherlands in 2021 and 2022. He's the past chair of the Department of Health and Human Services National Vaccine Advisory Committee. He's a frequent consultant to the state and federal agencies, as well as to the Institute of Medicine um, and the World Health Organization. And he's a member of the American Board of Pediatrics and a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics. So my introduction only touches the surface of what Gary has done in his remarkable um, career. So you can see why uh, Mark and the board has chose him, chosen him as this year's distinguished professor. So I very much look forward to he hearing his presentation on my career and research truisms. So please join me in welcoming Gary today. Thank you, um, Dr. Weinberger, and for everyone else for making this day possible. I really appreciate it. It's, um, it's humbling to come back home uh, to a place that was really important to me and important to my career and really was fundamental to my ability to do what I've been able to accomplish thus far. My first thought when being told that I won this award was, was I really at UNC that long ago to be considered for an award like this? So I kind of went back and looked at some of my old photos and everything and I found it, yeah, it was probably true because I found a photo of myself uh, demonstrating the size of the first grant that I received uh, here at UNC. And it was, you know, a substantive grant. And I thought, wow, that really more time has passed than probably I really had realized. So I wasn't born in North Carolina. I was not Tar Heel born, nor was I Tar Heel bred, except for the eight years that I was here. And so far, not Tar Heel dead. But um, I did come to UNC from Texas. And so the question arises, like why, those of you who've been to Texas know there's this like huge nationalism around Texas. Why would anyone ever leave Texas? And I was coming to do a fellowship, something called the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program, where there were only six sites in the country and UNC was one of them. And as I went around to interview at different places, I was struck by different things that happened in different cities. And this is actually a true story. So I stayed at the Carolina Inn. It wasn't quite as nice as it is now, but I stayed at the Carolina Inn. And I went for a walk on Franklin Street the night before my interviews. 
And this was in 1988, 89, long time ago. And I saw a new ice cream shop that had opened on the street. And I went in and I had the best ice cream I had ever had in my entire life. It was stunning. And I went back to the hotel. I called my wife. I said, we are moving to Chapel Hill. She said, you haven't even interviewed yet. I said, I had the best ice cream I ever had in my life. We are moving to Chapel Hill. So I came back and I told her what the name of the ice cream store was. It was called Ben and Jerry's, which I thought was a North Carolina ice cream shop that started in Chapel Hill. And like a month later, Ben and Jerry's became like a bigger concern. And then I saw it at the grocery store in the freezer section. I said, my wife, look, it's that North Carolina ice cream. But anyway, so we came and it became a wonderful, wonderful experience for us in many, in many ways. But it took a little adjusting to the culture here because I grew up in Texas, as I said, where the two main religions were Baptists and football. And I came here and that like was not the scene. And all of a sudden I realized if I didn't get into this new sport uh, called basketball, that I was gonna be left out of the social fabric of society. And so that became this transition, almost a religious transition um, to embrace this whole basketball culture. And I confess, I really at that time hadn't, I mean, I'd heard of Duke, but it like, it wasn't like a thing in my head. And then, but within 18 months, even though I had colleagues at Duke, I started to like hate Duke. It was like incredible how that just kind of permeates the feeling here. And that still exists to this day. Um, and then also, even though Texas is in the South and North Carolina is in the South, people do talk differently here than they talk in Texas. And so I have this one memory of going into the elevator at the hospital here and somebody walked in and I was standing next to the buttons and they said, mash three. I said, mash three what? <laughs> I had no idea what they were saying, but they wanted me to help them get to the third floor apparently. And then there was also this slurring of words where we had someone deliver wood to our house and someone came to the door and said, Mar. I said, what? He said, Mar. I said, what? And my wife said, he wants to know where you deliver the wood. So like she was translating for me, uh, but over time I was able to understand North Carolina speak. So that was very helpful as well. But I wanna talk also about the impact that the School of Public Health had on me now the Gillings School of Public Health. For one thing, I came here after having finished my pediatric residency. So I was a physician and I thought I knew a lot about healthcare. And I had never been exposed to the perspectives, the challenges, and for me as a physician, the humility of understanding how little I actually really knew about the healthcare system. And I would go to classes where people would just say things that triggered me into thinking, how dare you say those things about physicians and the way in which the healthcare system worked. And so it changed and reoriented how I looked at healthcare in a very meaningful, fundamental way. And I had to learn to take it. I had to learn to listen and to be able to appreciate and have what I thought was truth be challenged on multiple, multiple occasions. And it was great and it was exciting and it was energizing and it was intellectually wonderful. And I met professors who were experts in areas and arenas that were totally new to me and things I had never really understood to learn about health insurance why would a doctor ever need to know about health insurance? Like things that were fundamental to the way the world worked. That were so not even, they weren't even something I knew was missing in my education until I was exposed to them. And so all that new knowledge was transformative for me. And my worldview, the way I looked at healthcare in this country and in other countries, and the way in which things went from a population level to an individual level and back again. And as I said, and I want to emphasize, it was a humbling journey because I had to admit to myself how little I knew 
and then also be honest intellectually with those around me and to learn from them. And the department now called Health Policy and Management, back in the day it was Health Policy and Administration when I was here, was the perfect fit to do that. Both with the colleagues that I had, the fellow students that I met, and very importantly, the professors who had such a profound impact on me and my professional growth. And then I also learned from people here what I think is the real role of a state university. And that's to be in service to the people of the state and to be in service to the students of the state. And I think that's something now having been at other state universities, people don't get right the way the University of North Carolina gets right and the way in which this School of Public Health gets right. So hats off to this school for making a real difference in the lives of the people in the state and around the country, but, you know, North Carolina. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and start to talk about some of the things I think I've learned along the way. This is a, you know, alumnus award, so I get to wax poetically back from, you know, my years of experience. And I'd say to the students or the trainees in this room and elsewhere, is that one of the most important things is to find your passion. It doesn't matter, honestly, what other people's passions are. Because other people tell you, oh, you should study this, or oh, you should go into this, or oh, you should do that job. But what really matters is what's in your heart and what really gets you up in the morning and what creates fire in your belly. Find your passion, not others' passions, and pursue it. I would also say, no matter what you do, if you wanna be relevant, you gotta be relevant. You can't say you want to have a lot of relevance in the world and do things that aren't really top of mind or focused or going to have meaning. I also, as a researcher, in my head, I separate research from advocacy. I want people to trust the work that I do, no matter whether they're Democrats, whether they're Republicans, or whoever they are. They may not like my results, but they can always trust my results. And that's one of the things I learned here as well, is that even though I may not like it, different people are gonna be in power at different times. That's the reality. And if you don't wanna be frozen out of having a voice at the table, you've gotta be trusted. It can't be, oh, that's Freed's group. They always say that we should blank. Because once you do that, you're done. Then half the time people will listen to you and half the time people won't. So my belief is people should not and do not know my politics by my data. Along those same lines, you often hear people saying, I want to do a study that shows that we should do whatever. Usually that is whatever their preconceived notion is. I believe if you're doing research, you have to do research to see if, not to show that, because you're tipping your hand if you go the other way. And then lastly, something I learned, and I'll talk about my mentors in a second, is that the plural of anecdote is not data. And that we have a real responsibility to go beyond anecdote to try and have much broader impact on our society. Now, like people at the School of Public Health here and when I was here, we dealt with a lot of complex issues. And I also learned the humility side of this, was that there was no way in the world I was going to be able to understand and be an expert in all of them. I would be lucky if I got to be almost an expert in one of them. So the key was how to put together multidisciplinary teams. And to admit, from a humility standpoint, there's more you don't know than what you do know. And that opens up the ability to have amazing interchange in your classes, in your research, and in the leadership of a university. And that those different perspectives, even though I didn't want to hear some people say what they had to say, I'll be very candid. I didn't like it when people challenged what I knew as fact. But you know what? People didn't give up on me in this school from with my arrogance. And um, they helped to give me humility and helped me to understand the different perspectives actually added value to that final product. And then also gave me the opportunity to have intellectual reciprocity, to be able to find my voice that could be helpful 
in that multidisciplinary world. And that brings us to the next point, which is that no one really works alone, even though we'd like to think sometimes we do, but we really don't. And I think one of the most important things that I want to say today is the value and the importance of mentors. And I had what I consider to be the best mentor I ever could by someone who was a faculty member in this school, um, Gordon DeFries. He was also the director of the Cecil Shep Center for Health Services Research and the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program here. And from Gordon, I learned how to be a researcher, how to think critically. He gave me no quarter in terms of challenging me and trying to make me put up or shut up about my ideas. And I'll give an anecdote to that in a little bit. But that mentor, Gordon, has remained a mentor for my entire life. And I'm proud to say that when I went to the University of Michigan to start a pediatric health services research center, I built that center based on Gordon's example. And then ultimately, some of the people that I mentored there went off to start their own centers, again, based on the example of the research center here at UNC. So those became his academic grandchildren in a way. Um, and so that the, the impact of what went on here on this campus has had an impact rippling across many universities around this country. My other primary mentor, although it pains me to say it, is a faculty member at Duke, but he went to UNC and he got his, um, he got his degrees from UNC and he lives in Chapel Hill. And that is someone who went on to found the Public Policy Institute at Duke, uh, Joel Fleischman. Really an outstanding, wonderful human being, the only rena true Renaissance man that I actually know. A lot of people call themselves that. This is a true Renaissance man, an amazing fund of knowledge, an amazing font of wisdom, also a mentor to me to this day. And I think that those of you who find your mentors and they're a real mentorship relationship, hang on to them. Because as you go through life, those are very, very valuable relationships. I also had a lot of professors here. Most of them now retired, um, but they had fundamental influence in my life, whether that was Andrea Biddle, who was my master's thesis advisor, uh, Tom Rice, who taught me health economics, which was probably the most enlightening course I've ever had in my entire life, kind of demystifying how the healthcare system really works, not the way that I thought it was, or I thought that it did. And Pat Berry, there were several others who made a real difference in my life and teaching me things in this department that made a difference and still make a difference for me throughout my career. I also had an amazing colleagues from the university, one of them sitting here right now, Adam Goldstein, and it's his birthday. Happy birthday, Adam. Um, I, Adam Goldstein, Don Pathman, um, Bob Conrad, wonderful, outstanding colleagues who also helped me to learn, challenge, and in this idea that we don't work alone, we were much better together, the sum of our parts, than we would ever have been alone. And then ultimately, once you get a little older, you start to have your own mentees and that you can recognize that it's a wonderful enriching opportunity, both to be able to carry on what your mentors have shared with you, but then your ability to also have an impact on the pathway that other people are engaging. And those mentors, like I said, are unique relationships. They're important during your entire career. Those of you who are seeking out mentors, don't limit them to your field. My mentors were a medical sociologist and an attorney, public policy person, and my field was pediatrics. So don't limit yourself to where you think your mentors might be. And then also recognize that not to give up on your old mentors, but recognize that at different stages in your careers, you will likely need other mentors with other skills, other experiences, and other perspectives. And also those research colleagues are partnerships that don't ever have to go away. And those partnerships can remain over time. Hopefully you get new colleagues as you go along as well, but don't give up on the old ones. 
because you may share common interests, both at a local level, state level, national level, and they also develop into hopefully really strong and meaningful intellectual relationships as well. Also along the way, I learned the importance of being a good colleague. Some people are takers, some people are givers, some people are both. I think it's really important, and this I learned here at the University of North Carolina as well, is how to be a good colleague, because I think we do it really well here. And I think we model it really well here. That we share ideas, we share instruments, we're helpful to one another, and we're generous with recognition. That doesn't happen everywhere by a long shot. But I think those are the values that were embodied in this department and in this school and in this university. And like I said, with mentees, it's a real, those are unique relationships where there's bi-directional learning and that you get a chance to mature, to watch maturation over time, just as I hope my mentors had that for me. And it's really a wonderful thing to see. Now I wanna share with you a few stories about how I ended up at this podium and what were the pathways that I took, many of which started here at UNC, to be able to find my direction and find out the mechanisms by which I could have impact. So sometimes that can happen from personal or from, you know, if you're a clinician in some way, from clinical experiences. And for me, that happened and how I really ended up here, besides Ben and Jerry's, was I thought I was just going to be just going to be a pediatrician who took care of kids one on one and made a difference in people's lives, which I think is a great thing to do. And it's a very noble thing to do. But then in my second year of residency, and I think my wife is watching, so I'm sure she's cringing at this story. Um, my wife was pregnant with our first child. And I was at home watching television, sitting on the couch. It was residency. It's every third night call. It was like, you know, bad days. And she came home and she said, saw me sitting on the couch. She said, Gary, how are we going to feed this baby? I said, um, I don't know. She said, tell me what you know about breastfeeding. And I just sat there. She said, hey, I'm talking to you. You're not post-call. Talk to me. I said, I don't know anything about breastfeeding. She said, how can you not know anything about breastfeeding? You're a second year pediatric resident. I said, that's a really good point. I I don't know. Maybe I slept when, you know, they were talking about breastfeeding. And this was at a time in the late 80s when breastfeeding was at a real nadir in the United States. Only around 20% of people started breastfeeding at that time. And she said, well, you know, go talk to your friends in residency and come back and let's have a real discussion. So I went the next day, came home. She said, well, what'd you find out? I said, they don't know anything about breastfeeding either. She said, what are you doing? Hanging out with a bunch of clods? Like, how can y'all not know anything about breastfeeding? I said, that's a really good question. And then that started me having a discussion with someone, a different faculty member where I was in residency, who was a former clinical scholar, who went to clinical scholars at UNC. And he said, maybe this is a bigger issue. Have you thought about, you know, this is a big, you know, bigger issue. And I thought, no, I really hadn't thought about that because I was only thinking about taking care of people one-on-one. -on -one. And that led to a whole host of different studies about why don't doctors know about breastfeeding? And then ultimately later, why don't dads know anything about breastfeeding when we're wanting them to be supportive? We went to childbirth coaching classes and they had an extra class about breastfeeding on Sunday. So I thought for the women, so I thought, well, I'll go because I don't know anything about breastfeeding and I'm going to be a pediatrician. And I went and it was me and 20 women. And they looked at me like I was a pervert, right? Like I was just there to see breasts. But I thought, wow, this is how dads learn about breastfeeding. So that led to more studies about that. And then when I came, so that gave me this population health standpoint, which made me even think about doing clinical scholars, which made me even think about coming to UNC. And then ultimately, Jim Sorensen, who's long since retired, was the chair of health behavior and health education here at the School of Public Health, was my mentor for the first NIH Career Development Award on breastfeeding, um, because no one had ever thought about that before. But people at the School of Public Health took a risk with me, wanted to help me go that route. 
And then ultimately, some studies with Adam Goldstein here with family medicine doctors as well in this game, we started to really make a difference in both breastfeeding education for physicians, for the inclusion of fathers in breastfeeding education, and a variety of other things around the country. Again, coming out of my time here at UNC. And then sometimes things don't happen on, you know, from a personal experience. Sometimes it can happen just by serendipity. And that's how a big part of my life was involved in immunization policy and financing. Even to, as you heard, I chaired the National Vaccine Advisory Committee for the Department of Health and Human Services. That all happened by serendipity. And my mentor, Gordon DeFries, who's watching online, um, was a big part of that because I was in the clinical scholars program, like I said, Gordon was the director, and we stepped seminars and different people you know, gave research presentations. And there was a woman at the front talking about how obstetricians, um, she was an obstetrician, aren't following guidelines for repeat C-sections. This was at a time when everyone was putting out guidelines, no one bothering to see if anyone was following them. They just like stuck them out there. And she was bemoaning the fact that these obstetricians weren't doing what they were supposed to do. So as you know, I only care about children. I like some adults, but I just don't care about them. So I was looking underneath the table during the seminar at my American Academy of Pediatrics newspaper. And in that newspaper was a big sign or a big ad or announcement that said a particular vaccine was going to be given now at 15 months of age instead of 18 months of age. The earlier you can give it, the more you can prevent disease and stuff. And Gordon DeFries was sitting next to me and he was half asleep. Um, and he, this is something I've not been able to replicate. He has this ability to be asleep, but still listen and like can ask the most insightful, amazing questions, even though I'm sitting next to him and I know his breathing has changed and he's asleep. I don't know how he does it. I tried to learn that from him, not able to. But so I elbowed Gordon, woke him up and I said, you know, those obstetricians, they don't do what they're supposed to do. But every pediatrician who sees this is going to do it. He said, how do you know? I said, I just know it. Remember my arrogance? I just know it. We do what we're told to do by the American Academy of Pediatrics. He said, I don't believe you. I said, well, it's true. He said, prove it. And that started, he brought me over to the Shep Center and um, started me on this pathway of trying to figure out, do people really follow guidelines and recommendations? what influences whether they do or not. And three months later, I was fixing to go to the field with a survey to see for all the pediatricians in North Carolina, had they adopted this recommendation. And as I was sitting there, I was sitting there that morning at my at our breakfast table in the morning, having breakfast with my son before I took him to daycare. And I saw in the Raleigh News and Observer, which I think still exists, right? Raleigh News and Observer, they had, um, these like little national news and brief little paragraphs. And one of those was vaccine for meningitis now recommended at two months of age. And remember, I saw that thing for 15 months of age. So luckily the survey hadn't gone out yet because the recommendation changed again. But I thought, why am I reading about this in the Raleigh News and Observer? And are doctors gonna change the way they practice medicine because they read it in the Raleigh News and Observer? And that led to a whole series of research with colleagues from the School of Public Health and the Shep Center that started to change the way in which vaccine recommendations were promulgated or announced or sent out in this country. And those studies showed the confusion that would go on when different agencies or organizations put out sometimes competing recommendations, sometimes confusing recommendations. And ultimately that research ended up with us having a national um, table of recommendations that all of the organizations, all of the federal agencies all buy into together. But that came from me elbowing Gordon in the seminar to say that all pediatricians would do that and him challenging me. Again, coming from UNC. Amazing, right? Like that challenge, how do you know? Prove it. It's also important and you can learn from listening to others. 
And some of that started for me when I was a clinical scholar here at UNC. I had had this experience when I was a resident back in Houston, Texas, where it was a hospital that took care of around about 30% of our patient population spoke no English. They, it was Spanish speaking. And I knew a little bit of medical Spanish, but I wasn't fluent. And if you were working in the emergency department, there'd be, you know, seven hour waits for families. So you were trying to like move stuff through as quickly as you possibly could. And so sometimes if you had a family that had been in the country for six months, they might have a little seven year old in the room that could speak perfect English. And so you'd use that seven year old kid as your translator so you could move them through faster. And sometimes, this is before ethics, um, sometimes you'd pull one seven year old kid from one room to help you translate in another room. And we thought this was the greatest thing in the world because, like, you know, you could move kids through. I was at a clinical scholars meeting my, um, right after I finished clinical scholars, my first year on the faculty here at UNC. And somebody, his name is Glenn Flores, presented a paper, first time anyone ever looked, how good those seven-year-old translators are. Now, in retrospect, who in their right minds would ever have a seven-year-old kid translate for you, you know? And they were terrible. They tell you to put ear infection medicine in kids' ears instead of taking it by mouth and like just all sorts of stuff. Patently obvious. But wasn't what wasn't obvious was that I never would have thought to do that study. I was too busy, happy I had that little translator. But it took Glenn Flores from his own experience and his own perspective as a Hispanic American physician to say, wait a minute. And I never would have done that study. So all of a sudden, I realized by listening to Glenn that there was so much that I was not seeing and the need to have different voices around that table when we're designing studies, when we're thinking about projects to make sure whatever we're doing is gonna actually help people. Because inadvertently we can screw up. So listening to others. And that's an important aspect in what I do now in the, the work in child health inequity. And then also sometimes you have to take a risk and see whether or not you can, as they say, skate to where the puck is going, not skate to where the puck is, and see if you can pick something out that might be of importance later on before everyone realizes it. And so those are blind spots that other people have, but can also be opportunities for you, opportunities for career success, and importantly, an opportunity to make a difference. And for me, some of those were, um, well, one of them was the timing of results. And I'll give you, this is my last anecdote, I promise. Um, many of you have heard of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. So this was coming out um, in the 90s and there was, um, or late 90s, there was um, a provision in there that was going to double the number of trainees in primary care in America. And people thought, okay, people are having trouble getting into primary care, so that's a good thing. Well, primary care doctors in America aren't one entity. There's general internal medicine, there's family medicine, and there's general pediatrics, all three of those. So if you were to double the number of primary care physicians in America, family medicine, there was a decrease in the number of people being trained, that was gonna be a good thing for America. Internal medicine, in order to be a primary care internal medicine doctor, you first do an internal medicine residency. And then many of those then can go on to specialize afterwards. In internal medicine, only 11% of people stayed as a primary care doctor and 89% specialized, like they being cardiologists, kidney doctors, lung doctors, whatever. So if you doubled that, you went from 11% to 22%, you'd really help out more adults getting primary care. In pediatrics, you have to do a residency and then you can go on to specialize if you just do the residency or primary care doctor like myself. 
in peak, remember it was 11% for internists, right? For pediatricians, 42% went into primary care. If you doubled that, those of you who are good at math, you will recognize that you would then go into 84% of pediatricians going into primary care. You'd flood the market with primary care doctors. We don't need near that many. And you would starve where the real shortages are in pediatrics, which is in specialty care. But people weren't thinking about that. They were thinking, oh, primary care, mostly in America and everywhere else. When we talk about healthcare, we pretty much talk about adults and think that whatever works for them works for kids. So this was the Affordable Care Act was going to have financial incentives to double the number of primary care physicians. And so I had just done this workforce study that showed that, oh, my God, this could be terrible. And um, luckily, um, it was published in JAMA, and it got to be picked up pretty quickly. It was in the New York Times. And someone, uh, like the day after it was in the Times, I got a call from a staffer in the office of Senator Max Baucus, who at that time was the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, um, which is where the Affordable Care Act was coming from. That's the, the committee where the bill was being written. And basically I'd said in this article, this is gonna be a disaster you know, for children's health in America. And so he called me, um, the staffer, never told me who it was, said, hi, I'm from Senator Bucks, blah, 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 blah. He said, I just read in the New York Times, not in JAMA, but I just read in the New York Times that if we double the number of primary care pediatricians in America, we will destroy the pediatric healthcare system. Is that really true? I said, yes. And he hung up the phone and they changed the bill. Crazy. Serendipity, just sometimes you get lucky and you hit the results just at the right times. And you can see people, if they are willing to admit a blind spot, you can have a chance to make a difference. So as you go forward in life, set the bar high, have standards, have rigor, try and set high expectations for yourself and try and meet them. Anyone can do interesting work. Everything's interesting. Don't just do interesting work. Do work that's relevant. A lot of interesting questions that don't make a difference. Do things that make a difference, things that are relevant. And I would say for one's research or professional pathways, work to earn the respect of your colleagues. I think one of the things that was great here at the School of Public Health is people challenged me to earn their respect. And that the rigorous education and training that I had here made all the difference in me being able to move forward from this foundation. And our future challenges are how to both maintain and raise the standards of what we want to see. And then my own soapbox is the other big challenge is the aging of America. Not because I'm concerned about how we're gonna take care of all the old people. I'm concerned about when everyone's so focused on all the old people, how are we gonna make sure we don't take the eye off of kids? and make sure that we devote time, effort, and resources to that next generation. But sometimes not everyone is gonna be elected who we want to be elected. So this is a quote from Milton Friedman, we must create a politically profitable environment for the wrong people to make the right decisions. We have to figure out a way, no matter who's in power, to provide data, information, and do our best to still make sure we can stay the course. Because we may all have come on different ships, but as Martin Luther King said, we're in the same boat now. So we have to work together to be able to move forward and to try and do the best we can because Tar Heel born, Tar Heel bred, and when I die, I'll be Tar Heel dead. Thank you very much. And I just do want to say thank you out loud, again, to my mentors, my colleagues, my mentees, my bosses, and really, really importantly to um, my family, uh, certainly my wife, my three children, Ben, Michelle, Ariel, um, one of my sisters who I know is watching, Iris, and um, all of those who have provided me both guidance, support, 
um, have been challenging to me, especially my children, um, when they needed to be, and sometimes when they didn't, because um, all of that has helped to make me who I am and has helped me through their support to accomplish things to bring us to this day. So thank you to all of you and especially to my wife, Eileen. Appreciated your approach around diversity and, and the example that you gave with that and, and the approach around equity. But a lot of the studies are showing now that the number of um, individuals of color who are going into medicine is really stagnant. It has actually, I think there's some numbers that say if you look back in the early 70s, the numbers may have been greater of um, people of color who are going into medicine. And, and we know that representation matters. We know that individuals being able to see people to look like them as they receive care is so important. What's your, talk to us about your, your thoughts on that. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. So that's a really important question. And to be very specific, this is most acute for black males. Um, there are as many black males in medical school today as there were in 1977 in absolute numbers. There has been no increase. Every decade we talk about how terrible this is, and then we talk about it again the next decade. I have two thoughts on this. One is the, the notion that it's a very long pathway to get to medical school. And I believe strongly in programs for high school students and college students to try and encourage them and provide opportunities for people to see medicine and things in different ways. But I believe that pathway starts much earlier and that unless that there's issues in preschool, elementary school, junior high that impact that trajectory before kids ever get to university, because some kids don't get to university because of those trajectories. It's my belief that if we don't start these programs and take a real serious look at how we do things from kindergarten onward, let's just say, because that's in most states, the public domain, we will be having the same conversation 20 years from now. And we have to address early childhood education in a meaningful way, or else I think all these other things are folly and we're never gonna get out of the situation that we're in right now. I will also say that I think from my, and I will share now another personal experience. After I had that experience where I learned about the translation thing, I recognized that we needed, when I went to Michigan, I wanted to create this diverse research center. And so I looked around the country of who I could recruit. There were three African-Americans trained in pediatric health services research in the entire country, and roughly the same number of Hispanic uh, physicians trained in pediatric health services research. So I realized that if we ever wanted to get anywhere in having a diverse workforce, I needed to set up a training program of some mechanism to bring more people to get those diverse views around the table. But I didn't know how to do it. So I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna go to all of the historically black medical schools and I'm gonna call their chairs of pediatrics and say, I'd like to come and give a talk to your residents, tell them about this great fellowship I've just started and that they should come and do this. They all said, great, come on. So I went, gave these great talks, nobody came. And then when you think about it, why would someone change their whole career because some white guy got in front of them for 45 minutes and told them about something? It was silly, right? So I thought, okay, humility. I wanted to know, could I go talk to those chairs and ask them, what do you think I ought to do? I said, do y'all ever get together? They said, well, not really, but we all go to this thing called the National Medical Association, which is the Black Physicians Organization. And we, I said, look, if I bought everybody breakfast, if I came, would y'all have breakfast with me? And let's talk about what kind of strategies we can do. They said, oh yeah, sure, you buy them breakfast. I'll be happy to show up. So I went there and two things happened. Number one, we talked about how to set up an elective program that would bring people and pay to come during residency and get a sense of this. And actually that became quite successful. And I would say 
up until about 10 years ago, when more people started doing stuff like that, we had trained easily a third of all the African-American um, pediatric health services researchers in America came through our program. But what even better than that happened was I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna go check out the pediatric section at the National Medical Association because I was there. I wasn't gonna just you know leave. And I walked into a room where there were 200 people and no one looked like me. Now, for some of you in the audience, that happens to you every single day. White people are rarely in the minority and professional settings in this country. And so all of a sudden, I didn't know where to sit and I didn't know who to talk to. And I didn't wanna say something stupid that might look poorly on me or look poorly on anything. And I don't for a second say I understand what other people go through, but I got a glimmer of what that was like. And I decided to lean into it. So I've been to the NMA for 16 years now. And, um, and I go, I was just at the Student National Medical Association meeting um, last month or earlier this month. And I leaned into that discomfort and I leaned into relationships. And after going for four or five years, people started to believe that I was serious, but it took a while to build trust. And all of a sudden I started having, all of a sudden after those four or five years, conversations didn't stop when I walked up. And I began to have conversations and discussions with people I would never have otherwise. And importantly, got to listen to people talk amongst themselves because after a while that started to happen. And some of the colleagues I have at the NMA are the same colleagues I have in the majority organizations, but the conversations we have at the NMA meetings are very different than what we have when we're in majority settings. So I say that to say that I think there's a lot of issues that go on here. I think we have to deal with the early education. There's no question in my mind about that. But we also have to be able to figure out ways to have real partnerships with people, not necessarily just superficial partnerships, which is what I was trying to set up when I started out. But it took years. People have to be really committed to this, you know? And so now I have, we've started a couple of new centers on child health equity at the University of Michigan, um, where the real partnership is there. But it takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of intentionality to do it. Great question. So the question is, what would I do differently if I was graduating right now? Probably hold a little tighter to the professors that made a real difference in my life at this stage of the game and not have let those important influences and sources of knowledge leave from my sphere as quickly as I did. I think that I learned a ton and I thought, okay, I've learned a lot, let's move on. And I think that I didn't allow myself the ability to maintain those relationships and to get even further insight beyond what I had received in the classroom setting. But you say where the puck is going. I'm kind of curious because I have been living in the last few months in some of the world of AI mm. and really thinking about its impact. But I've only thought about it in terms of adult populations. And I'm curious, both from a health policy perspective, but particularly a health policy perspective as it relates to to children, have you have you begun to think about two or three really things that just kind of you think, wow, I wonder what this new technology may mean for the type of work that you've done in the past and the work that needs to be done in the future? So I think that's a amazingly insightful question. I would expect nothing less from you. Um, I will say AI scares the hell out of me. 
and this whole chat GPT stuff, I fear that this is going to be the demise of Western civilization. I think the ability to know that anything is true going forward is going to be super problematic. And I fear for kids, one of the biggest fears I have for kids in this is with regard to social media and whether there are going to be things that are, you know, the bullying that currently goes on. This creates just enormous opportunities for bullying to go way beyond anything we've ever seen before. In terms of what could be positive from it, I've been thinking a lot about that and having discussions both within my family and with my colleagues. And although I know there are positive things that come from that, that can come from this and that you read about them in the paper pretty much every day now, I am very worried about the ability to regulate or to keep any kind of semblance of order in this growing industry. And there's an article in the Times a couple of days ago about the industry leaders asking for regulation because there is none right now. But I fear in a political environment in which we exist right now to create new regulation is going to be really difficult. And I wish I could answer your question, but part of this whole humility thing is saying, I just don't know. And I sure as hell hope someone figures this out because it's really dangerous right now. How do you encourage your mentees to be willing to take risks, like not take the safe path, but you know, you can make mistakes and come back and recover. And it's hard for people to believe that. And um, no matter how many times you say it, and it doesn't matter what level of student you're dealing with. So it's a great question. I would say there's two ways that I try and do it, but that there's, I'm sure there's others. One is to share my own failures, to share where things didn't work out. And I think sometimes we're loath to do that because we think people won't respect us as much if we share those failures. And so I think it's really important. And to talk, sometimes a failure can hurt. You know, it's not just really easy to dust yourself off. The other thing is, is for those individuals who we feel need to be supported when they fail, we either have to support them when they fail or we help them find the mentors that do. I was very fortunate. My mentors, I knew were going to be there whether I failed or succeeded. And I think we have to hopefully build that same trust with our mentees. And if it's not us, help them find the people that can do it for them.